On his return from Brownsea, Baden-Powell wrote Scouting for Boys. Published in six parts, it was an instant success. In four months, 100,000 copies were sold. It would go on to outsell all printed books apart from the Bible, the Quran, and the thoughts of Chairman Mao. Baden-Powell could have made his fortune from it, but instead donated all the profits to the scouts. Today, the Boy Scout Manual is the handbook for democratic youth the world over. More than 10 million copies have already been sold. It is a guide for the Boy Scout who, one night each week, assembles with his troop to reaffirm his own oath and to administer it to any new member. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Scouting owes its appeal to Baden-Powell's knack for being all things to all men. Back in 1908, the establishment applauded its military bias, the church approved of its good deeds. And Edwardian boys found the packaging irresistible. I did try other organisations, the, the cadets who went around blowing bugles and I soon got bored with that, so I chucked it up. But uh, the Scouts gave you so much more opportunity to be yourself. It was the comradeship. And I loved hiking out in the country with my mates, camping and learning woodcraft and about nature, the, the wonder of nature, which I was so impressed with always have been impressed with. Scouting was intended to make boys manly, so there was no place in it for girls. But this was the time of the suffragettes, and the girls were not going to let the boys have it all their own way. They agitated for an organisation of their own. In 1910, Baden-Powell gave in, appointing his sister, Agnes, first president of the Girl Guides. But the guides faced fierce opposition from parents, worried that their outdoor activities were not at all ladylike. To calm their nerves, Agnes warned girls against over-enthusiasm. Violent jerks and jars can ruin a girl's interior economy and damage prospects of childbearing. She also expressed a concern that there are more girls nowadays with hairy lips, and I believe it due to the violent exercise they take. Will you do your best? Answer me. Throughout his 30 years as Chief Scout, Baden-Powell issued his own warnings to the nation's boys. And I'm coming round to look at your tents. They must firmly resist the sexual cravings of youth, which he dismissed as... The rutting season. A trying little interlude which boys, if they take it calmly, will get over just as they would get over the measles. Masturbation, he warned, was the most dangerous of all vices. If a boy carries it on too far, he very often goes out of his mind. A very large number of the lunatics in our asylums have made themselves mad by indulging in this vice. Scoutmasters, he said, must stamp out the evil of masturbation. He urged them to push prudery on one side and take their boys in hand. We all have things inside us that we don't really want to recognise, and when that happens, as it happened with Lord Baden-Powell, what one tends to do is that you don't acknowledge them in yourself, but you see them in other people. So that if I'm frightened of, of masturbation, or I'm frightened of looking at women, uh, or I'm frightened of, of a desire to, to smoke, I don't see it in myself, but I say, you mustn't masturbate, you mustn't be fond of women. So that uh, a lot of his uh, attempt to wipe all the, the evils that he saw them out in, in the world was really trying, I think, to project outwards his own feeling that those things were inside him. By 1911, 
Baden-Powell was father to a movement of a quarter of a million boys and girls. But he had no children of his own, and his mother was pestering him to get married. Sailing to America on scout business that summer, he met Olive Soames. He was 55, she 23. Strong, energetic, and with a love of the outdoors, she was an ideal match for Baden-Powell. They were married the following year. Baden-Powell was really put on the spot by his mother, so you've got to get married. Or less. And so he had to find somebody who would, in a sense, suit his mother and also suit himself. And in this sense, Olive was ideal. She was boyish, she was athletic, she was in a sense a sort of boyish man, if you like. So that for, as far as Baden-Powell himself is concerned, he wasn't really marrying a woman. He was sort of, sort of marrying a, a young man. And as far as his attitude to his mother was concerned, who was such a dominant lady, um, he, in her eyes, he, I think he would feel that she wouldn't be a real woman, so she wouldn't be a, a competitor to his mother. So I think in these two ways, uh, she was absolutely ideal. Not quite ideal. When it came to consummating the marriage, Baden-Powell began to suffer agonizing headaches. His doctor asked him to write down his dreams. He wrote them down in great detail, and I have looked through them. One was that he was uh, looking in a shop window, and a man put his hand in his pocket, and Baden-Powell looked down at his chest and found a lump, which nowadays one would interpret as the, the lump of an erection so that that was a very sexual dream. The other was when he was looking for his wife uh, and there was a choice of two doors. He opened one and it was the incorrect door and inside that was not his wife, it was a young officer who was at, at the wash basin, half undressed. And what does that indicate to you? I think both of these indicate that there were, there was, of course, as one would, would realise, a sexual arousal in him, as there is in everybody, and certainly that if there's a choice between male and female, as in the second dream, that he would go for the man. Despite the headaches and the troubling dreams, Baden-Powell did love his wife and succeeded in fathering three children. When the Great War broke out, the scouts were prepared. They tilled the fields, took on coast-watching duties, and even emptied the rubbish. As recreation for the troops, scout huts were set up in France. Baden-Powell spent several months there. But the carnage he now witnessed dulled any enthusiasm he'd once had for the glory of battle. Today, I saw hundreds of men singing like schoolboys in their tubs. I dare say it won't be long before many of them will be festering in the fields around this very bathhouse. Somebody ought to be hanged for it. He particularly deplored, you know, the death of a young men whom he adored. And after the war, he took any kind of militarism right out of the movement. He was determined that it should be essentially a peace movement dedicated to the ideals of international peace through young people meeting each other. And of course, one has to say that there was a realistic point, too, in doing this, because warfare after the Great War was not very popular, and any sort of idea that young men were flocking to the colours by joining the Scouts would have been extremely unpopular. The pursuit of international peace meant spreading the Scout gospel beyond the world of the white man. Though Baden-Powell admired tribal people who lived close to nature, his racial views were often less than pure. Baden-Powell had attitudes towards blacks and towards Jews that were unattractive. Uh, blacks were lazy and untrainable uh, and inert and stupid. Jews were uh, greedy and self-serving. Uh, there is a caricature that Baden-Powell drew um, of a nouveau riche uh, Jewish woman, a classic kind of anti-Semitic stereotype. Uh, these were not his views alone, these were views that were shared obviously by many people of his class. Uh, so the point is not to condemn him as a racist or an anti-Semite, uh, but it's to understand what, what the package of values were that he was sharing. <laughs> 